Hi all. So let's practice calculating z-scores and converting them into p-values. So for this first question, a statistician wish wishing to test a hypothesis that students score at least 75 on the final exam in introductory statistics course decides to randomly select 20 students in the class and have them take the exam early. The average score of the 20 students on the exam was 78. The standard deviation in the population is known to be 15%. The p-value for this hypothesis is so first thing we do is we start plugging in these numbers into the z equation up here. So x bar, sample mean. For our sample mean, it is 78. Next one is the null hypothesis, which is set to 75. The standard deviation is given to us 15. The amount of people in our sample is given to us 20. So once you enter in all of those numbers, you calculate it through and you get a z of 0 0.895. So now that we have a z-score, we can apply it to the z-table over on the right. So we know that this is a one-tail test because there's a direction given. It's not does not equal. It says that the scores were at least 75, meaning they're expecting the scores to be greater. So we know that we can do a one-sided p. So if we head over, we see that the score that we got for z is in between these two scores, 0.841 and 1.036. So we can say that the p-value for this one-sided test is in between 0.15 and 0.2. So because this number is greater than the 0.05 threshold, we fail to reject the null hypothesis that student scores equal 75 meaning we can't prove otherwise that the scores are different than 75. So great, let's hop over to the next question. Suppose we're testing the null hypothesis that the population mean is 20, and the alternative is that the population mean is not 20. For a normal population with a standard deviation of 5, a random sample of 25 observations are drawn from the population and we find a sample mean from the observations. So sample mean equals 17.6. So what's the p-value? Again, let's plug everything in. The sample mean, it's given to us, it is 17.6. The null hypothesis given to us, it's 20. The standard deviation given to us, it's five. The amount of participants, 25, that's given to us. Okay, let's break this down further. It goes into net negative 4 over 1, which is the same as just negative 4. So now let's go over to the z-table. Note that the sign of the z-score doesn't matter because the distribution of z is symmetrical. So we find that it's in between these two values, 2.326 and 2.576. And let's see if it's a one or two tail test. Because it's not equal to, that gives us information that's going to be a two-tailed test. So we can figure out that the p-value is going to be in between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. Note that this is different than the last problem because in the last one, our p-value was greater than 0 0.05. So in this one, it's less than. So we're going to write this a little bit differently. So in this situation, we reject the null hypothesis that the population mean is 20. Instead, we support the alternative hypothesis that the population does not equal 20. Great, let's go to one more word problem, then we can go to some multiple choice. So, the level of calcium in blood for healthy young adults follows a normal distribution with a mean of 10 milligrams per deciliter and standard deviation being 0.4. A clinic measures blood calcium of 25 healthy pregnant women in their first in their first visit for prenatal care. The mean of these 25 measurements is a sample mean of 9.6. Is there evidence that the mean is lower for women? Is essentially what's asking. To answer this, you find the p-value. So again, we're given all the numbers we need. Let's plug them on in. Sample mean is 9.6. The null hypothesis is 10, the standard deviation 0.04, the sample 25, 
crunch all the numbers into your calculator, and you end up with negative 5. Okay, let's hop back over to the z-score. Uh, note that there is no 5 on this. It goes too far. But if we were to extrapolate, meaning push these numbers down, you would no you notice that as z-score gets larger, the one-sided p-value and the two-sided p-value become smaller. So this trend continues as it goes down. So because we don't have enough to go all the way to negative 5, what we can say is that the p-value is going to be less than this number as it continues down, so it's going to be less than 0 0.005. So we reject the null hypothesis that the population mean for calcium blood levels in unhealthy pregnant women is 10. Instead, we support the alternative hypothesis that the population mean is less than 10. Great. Now let's hop over to the multiple choice. In a test of hypothesis, a small p-value provides evidence of what? So when you have a small p-value, it provides evidence against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So the answer to that would be A. If a hypothesis test is significant at a level of alpha 0 0.05, what is known for the p-value? Well, if it's significant at an alpha level of 0 0.05, we know that the p-value will be less than or equal to 0 0.05, so that would be C. The p-value measures the strength of evidence of what? So whenever you're measuring a p-value or you're doing significance testing of any sort, you are providing evidence against the null hypothesis. So the answer to that is A. For 4, a p-value is always computed assuming that the, and the answer to this is that the null hypothesis is true. You always assume that it's true, and you find evidence either way based on the laws of probability. And then now for this last one. Um, admittedly, this question is pretty difficult, and I think this is a bit harder than what I would put on a test. But essentially, uh, what this is asking is a definition of, of what a p-value is put in the context of this example. So, 7. A university administrator obtains a sample of academic records of past and present scholarships, scholarship athletes at the university. The administrator reports that no significant difference was found in mean GPA, grade point average for male and female scholarship athletes. This means that, so essentially what it's asking you is, what does this mean that we found a p-value of 0.287? So for A, the GPAs for male and female scholarship athletes are identical except for 28.7% 20, of athletes. So um, this interpretation doesn't make a lot of sense because if you think about it, if you were to extrapolate it to other cases, for instance, say that they were identical except for 99.9%, .9%, then your p-value would be that large. And if your p-value is that large, that wouldn't make any sense because all of the, almost all of the student athletes would have different GPAs based on their gender. So that's unlikely. For B, the maximum difference in GPAs between male and female scholarship athletes is 0.287. So this one doesn't really work too because this is looking at it at the individual level instead of the large group level. So there are plenty, plenty of ways for the p-value to be something like 0.287 and there'd be really large discrepancies across um, individuals and groups. So that's not the case. And then for D, the chance that a pair of randomly chosen ma male and female athletes would have a significant difference in GPAs is 0 0.87. So this doesn't make a lot of sense either because there's no way to do a significance test when you only have one per group. So that's really unlikely to occur. So the answer is C, and, and the reason why is because... Uh, it's, it's really explaining how significance testing works in the first place. So it always comes with this general um, starting point 
where you're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And this is what the last sentence is getting at. Observed in a sample that there are no differences in GPAs. So when you do significance testing, you begin with this assumption. And this assumption is the null hypothesis that there are no differences between groups. And basically what this is saying is assuming that there are no differences in groups, the chance of obtaining a difference in GPAs between the males and the females that was as large as this or larger is 0.287. And this is the correct interpretation of what a p-value means. It's essentially just the definition of a p-value and how it works. And essentially what's that, what that's saying is just by chance, just by random sampling, because you, you know that there's going to be variability in your data set when we're looking at males' GPAs and females' GPAs, because you can only take so many into your sample. And from the sample, it's possible for you to take males with slightly higher GPAs than the average, females slightly higher, so on and so forth. And basically what it's saying is if there was truly no difference, that it's possible to get a deviation of this degree at about 28.7% of the time. And because that's so high, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. If there was a lot stronger evidence, like less than 0 0.05, then you might reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative that there were differences. So yeah, hopefully this helps uh, shine some light on this area. If you have more questions, please let me know either in the comments or if you're in my class, ask me in class or send me an email. Thanks so much and have a great day.